Good afternoon. This presentation is based on a study that was commissioned by the Department of Trade and Industry. Before I proceed, I would like to acknowledge my co-authors, Dr. Francis Kimba, who is the PIDS Trade Specialist, and Dr. Janet Cuenca, who specializes in public finance. So I will begin by providing a brief background about the study. The promotion of e-commerce has been part of the WTO agenda since 1998, when ministers adopted the Declaration on Global Electronic Commerce. The lack of a multilateral agreement on e-commerce to date prompted a group of WTO members led by Australia, Japan, and Singapore to issue a joint statement on electronic commerce in 2017 to initiate exploratory work towards future WTO negotiations. A second joint statement on electronic commerce was issued in 2019 to confirm members' intention to commence negotiations and achieve a high standard outcome that builds on existing WTO agreements and frameworks. In January 2020, the Philippines officially joined the Joint Statement Initiative on e-commerce. As a member, the Philippines is able to shape the development of a plurilateral agreement on the trade-related aspects of e-commerce and promote the interests of MSMEs. As of October 2020, the JSI had 86 members, which together account for 90% of world trade. The JSI covers various topics such as online consumer protection, paperless trading, source code, market access, and others. Our study focused on customs duties so this presentation is divided into two parts. First, I will provide an overview of the issues and then present some global estimates. In the second part, I will present estimates of the potential revenue losses for the Philippines and then discuss policy constraints and other factors that should be considered for a more balanced appreciation of the costs and benefits of the moratorium on customs duties. Before I provide the overview, it is important to emphasize that the moratorium refers to customs duties and not other taxes such as sales or value-added tax. Customs duties or tariffs are levied on imported goods either as a revenue-generating measure or a protective scheme to artificially or temporarily inflate prices to support the local industries of a particular country and protect its domestic output from their foreign counterparts. So what is the issue? In the 1998 Declaration on Global Electronic Commerce, there was a decision for members to continue their practice of not imposing customs duties on electronic transmissions. However, the moratorium is not permanent, and so member countries extended this regularly. With the JSI, there is now a move to make the ban permanent. It should be noted that a ban on customs duties on electronic transmissions is now incorporated in various bilateral, regional, and mega-regional trade agreements. In the three examples, the imposition of customs duties is prohibited, but parties to the agreement may still impose internal taxes. Furthermore, in terms of coverage, the agreements have adopted additional terms for greater clarity. Those who support a permanent ban say that this will provide greater certainty to consumers and business. Moreover, the imposition of customs duties on electronic transmissions is associated with technical challenges. Countries that support the ban argue that imposing customs duties on digital products would only hinder trade and discourage economic activity in the internet. In addition, the moratorium will prevent a barrier to entry for small and medium enterprises. Opponents worry that they will suffer greater revenue losses. Moreover, it prevents the imposition of a tariff as a trade policy to support infant and even mature industries. Countries that try to catch up with a rapidly and radically changing economy need time to become competitive before full liberalization becomes optimal. They argue that the permanent ban will leave developing countries with struggling industries as consumers in the digital economy. One of the champions opposing the permanent ban 
is Dr. Bang of Ongtad. She estimates a potential revenue loss to developing countries of $10 billion if bond rates are used. For least developed countries, it is estimated at $1.5 billion, while the loss to African countries is about $2.6 billion. Using average MFN applied rate, the potential tariff revenue loss of a moratorium is estimated at $5.2 billion for developing countries. High-income countries will experience a tariff revenue loss of $289 million, less than half of the potential tariff revenue loss to sub-Saharan African countries. In the study of Banga, she assumes that electronic transmissions involve digital products. So her study covered 49 products which are digitizable, meaning they were earlier traded only in physical form, but with digital technology are now being traded both in physical form as well as electronically. The second step is to estimate the physical trade, then using growth analysis, estimate the online imports of these products. According to Lee Makiyama and Narayanan, the economic and domestic tax losses that may arise if duties are implemented and the significant enforcement and compliance costs in implementing electronic tariffs were not included in the study of Banga. The assumption that virtually all physical media or paper-based products would be digitized and therefore exempt from duties under the moratorium was also not realistic. The static nature of the estimates of Banga also failed to realize that the effects on prices and on other markets may erode the benefits from additional revenue. There have been other studies on the potential revenue losses. The results differ depending on the choice of products and tariff rates used. Because of the different methods and assumptions, these range from between $280 million to $8.2 billion underscoring wide disagreement on measurement. Current estimates suggest that the opportunity cost in terms of foregone revenue due to the moratorium is likely to be low at 0.08% to 0.23% of overall government revenue. Lee Makiyama and Narayanan through a computable general equilibrium analysis which looks at the impact on the entire economy, find that the benefits from maintaining the duty-free status for electronic transmissions are far greater than the potential revenues that could be generated through tariffs. However, CGE analysis also has its limitations as no methodology is perfect. A key message from the review of various estimates by Andrianelli and Lopez Gonzalez is that ultimately countries should not only consider foregone revenues related to tariffs but also to undertake a broader cost-benefit analysis of the impacts across the economy and alternative revenue sources. The revenue implications of lifting the moratorium are likely to be relatively small and would come at the expense of more significant gains in consumer welfare and export competitiveness, for example, in terms of lower prices and access to digital technologies and services. The International Chamber of Commerce points out that no country has been able to explain how it would be even possible to collect customs duties on data flows without causing significant disruption to the digital world. Likewise, it has been argued that no customs authority has been able to demonstrate how a digital tariff system would work in practice. In the case of video streaming, it would be prohibitively expensive for customs officials to track these millions of electronic transmissions and determine their origin, and it would be nearly impossible to quantify their value. A few important characteristics of cross-border data flows are worth highlighting. First, packets take different routes when flowing between two countries, often crossing different third parties. The ultimate origin and destination of data flows is often a technical issue, 
For example, firms use mirror sites which replicate web pages in different countries to increase the speed of data transfers. In some instances, what might seem to be a domestic transfer involves a cross-border flow. Data should be valued at use rather than by volume. For instance, an Excel file with 100 personal shopping entries may occupy the same memory space as one with 100 personal health records, but its underlying value is very different depending on the perspective of the final user, whether a retailer or a health service provider. The value of data can also increase when merged to become greater than the sum of its parts. Data also has both inherent and potential value, meaning that information not used today can become valuable tomorrow with changing business dynamics or combined with different data yet to become available. Although data is often described as the new oil, this characterization is misleading. Like oil, it is an essential input into the economy. However, data is not scarce, and the consumption of data by one person or company does not prevent its consumption by others since data can be copied and transferred at almost no cost. In sum, data is different. I will now discuss our analysis for the Philippines by first presenting estimates of foregone revenues. As there is no agreement on what constitutes electronic transmissions, alternative measures were explored. The first estimate is based on the concept of digitizable products. In this scenario, Electronic transmissions refer to 49 products in the harmonized system which are digitizable, namely photographic and cinematographic films, printed matter, sound and media, software, and video games. Using bound rates, the revenue losses are estimated at $322 million. While using MFN rates, the revenue losses are estimated at $52 million. A second scenario would be to consider cross-border supply of services as electronic transmissions. Kozel, Wright, and Banga do not agree with this position as they believe that the classification of electronic transmissions should be limited to those intangible goods which are homogeneous, locally storable, and transferable. Nonetheless, they provide estimates to help countries better evaluate the impact of an expanded coverage of electronic transmissions. So this slide shows the estimate for the Philippines using the latest database of the WTO. Specifically, the value of imports by mode one or cross-border supply was used to represent the electronic supply of services. As can be seen in this table, however, mode one includes transport services which cannot be delivered electronically. So the estimated losses presented in the previous slide are overstated. In addition, distribution services should also not be included. These represent the commissions of intermediaries who do not own the goods they buy and sell and the margins of wholesalers and retailers who buy the goods before reselling them. Thus, the coverage of Mode 1 for purposes of determining electronic transmissions should be further reduced. This table shows the estimates of the potential revenue losses from imports of services via Mode 1 if we exclude transport and distribution services. Using bound rates, the losses are estimated at $1.8 billion, while using MFN duties, the estimated losses are $294 million. Another scenario could be to use UNCTAD's own concept of digitally deliverable services. Here, the potential losses using bound tariffs are estimated at $2.4 billion. While using MFN rates, the foregone revenues are estimated at $379 million. The summary table presents the estimated revenue losses using the different measures or interpretations of electronic transmissions. Of all the definitions of electronic transmissions, the biggest revenue loss would be in the case of Mode 1 services imports. As explained earlier, however, Mode 1 services, while considered cross-border supply, do not entirely represent services that could be electronically transmitted.
The potential losses are presented here in proportion to different measures of government revenues. As discussed earlier, Andrinelli and Lopez Gonzalez noted that for developing countries, the potential foregone revenues of the moratorium as a share of total revenue is relatively small, amounting to an average of 0.08% to 0.23% reduction in government revenues. The Philippine case appears to be consistent with their observations as can be seen in this table. Based on estimates of digitizable products and the average MFN rate, the foregone revenue is about 0.1% of the national government revenues, which comprise of tax and non-tax revenues as well as grants. Assuming that the definition of electronic transmissions is agreed upon and it is technically feasible to collect tariffs, there are existing laws or international commitments that the Philippines has undertaken that would limit the application of customs duties and therefore even lower the potential revenues that could be collected. The Customs Modernization and Tariff Act increased the de minimis value from 10 pesos to 10,000 pesos. Although it applies to goods, it could later be interpreted to cover digitizable products delivered electronically. Thus, duties and taxes will also not be collected on electronic transmissions with a value of 10,000 pesos or below. The Philippines is a signatory to the Information Technology Agreement, which is a plurilateral agreement where each participant is required to eliminate and bind customs duties at zero for all products specified in the agreement. So the ITA-1 in 1996 covered 217 products and the expansion of ITA in 2015 covered an additional 201 products. In view of the country's membership in the ITA, the Philippines can no longer impose duties on electronic transmissions of digital products covered in the agreement. The Philippines is a signatory to the Agreement on the Importation of Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Materials. Under the Florence Agreement, contracting states undertake not to apply customs duties or other charges on or in connection with the importation of different items such as books, publications, and documents. Given the country's obligations under the UNESCO Treaty, it could be argued that exemptions should also apply to the digitized products. If electronic transmissions are considered as services, these would be governed by the General Agreement on Trade in Services, or GATS. Under GATS, imposing a customs duty would violate national treatment obligations where commitments have been made since duties are by definition discriminatory. Here we've listed some of the services where the Philippines has made specific commitments either in the WTO or in ASEAN. Apart from the technical and policy constraints that may limit the tariff revenues that could be collected, it is important to consider other factors from the perspective of the overall national interest. For one, the Philippines is a net exporter in digitally deliverable services and in the cross-border supply of services. If other countries were to impose a tariff, then this would increase the price of Philippine exports. The Philippine ITBPM sector would also be adversely affected given the data-intensive nature of the services it offers. In the context of value chains, any policy that would artificially increase the cost of imports would make our exports less competitive. The value of cross-border data flows, however, is not confined to high-tech or data-intensive sectors such as ITBPM. Even traditional industries from agriculture, mining, and manufacturing are relying on data from all over the world to support the various stages of their operations and in the conduct of research and development. Moreover, data and the internet are now critical in driving commercial and international trade opportunities, particularly for SMEs. Consumers are benefiting as well from data sharing across borders. 
governments too rely on imported digital products, for example, digital maps, to deliver various public services. As such, trade openness and in particular, trade openness in the digital sector have economy-wide effects enabling productivity growth in both digital and non-digital sectors. Finally, it is important to anchor our international trade agenda on the national priorities and consider whether a tariff on electronic transmissions will help contribute or distract from the pursuit of the national agenda. So to summarize, this paper provided estimates of the potential revenue losses from a moratorium on customs duties based on different hypothetical definitions of electronic transmissions, practical difficulties and policy constraints which could limit the actual intake from tariffs were also presented. The practical difficulties refer to the technical challenges of implementing and enforcing customs duties, while the policy constraints refer to existing laws and international commitments of the Philippines, which are being pursued in line with other objectives of the government. Finally, we also noted other factors to be considered for a more balanced understanding of the costs and benefits of the moratorium. Thank you for your attention.